So there I was, one fine evening, setting up my Discord server, when I noticed that I needed a bot that could assign roles based on message reaction. So of course, as every sane human being, I went to Google to find a bot that could do that. But after trying one out, and finding out that you can make only two reactions for free, I decided to take things into my own two hands. So now came the time to choose the language in which I would write the bot in. Having already written multiple Discord bots in TypeScript, I wanted a challenge. So after some consideration, I chose Rust. Now, you might ask why, and you probably should, because that's not really the intent of use of the language. But after hearing so much about how it's the best programming language, the C++ beater, and how it's almost impossible to have runtime bugs because of the compiler, I wanted to try it. And since I was starting a new project, and it was simple enough, I said why not. So let me now take you on an adventure where I spent way too much time pouring blood, sweat and tears making a simple Discord bot. Just so you know, all of this was streamed live on my YouTube channel. Yes, the one you're watching this video on right now. You can find the link to the playlist of the streams for this project down in the description. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. Now back to the video. As I said, I never used Rust. So I had to go ahead and install it live on the stream. After installing it, I encountered the first of many errors. Not being able to run Rust C. But with my smart thinking, I remembered I had to reload the bash RC file to access the newly modified platform. Also, another very smart decision I made was to use Wim, or more precisely, NeoGen, which I never used, because why not? I set up the .env file containing the Discord bot token before the stream, so no one would be able to steal it. And I'm proud to announce that I did not like it in any of my streams, nor did I like it on my GitHub. I found a library for Discord bots written in Rust called Serenity, the link to which you can find in the description below, as well as the link to the GitHub repository I made for my bot. Figuring out how the cargo app works was very simple, having used Node.js in its package manager npm. But I have noticed that even Rust with its cargo package manager can't escape the awful truth of waiting for so long to have the package installed. After figuring out that a main.rs file already existed, and being happy that the hello world code works, I was ready to copy and paste the Serenity example Discord bot. And then I encountered my next nemesis, async main function and Tokyo. But being a long time developer, I used the best card I had, Google. With it, I found what Tokyo is, and then how to install it, and that fixed my error. But that error, just hiding something so shocking, something so horrifying, a runtime error. And when I wanted to go see where the error happened, I was missing something. So that's when I decided to add line numbers. The error happened because Rust couldn't find my environmental variable even though I put it in my .env file. So after seeing what the standard env package does, and some googling to find a way to load the .env file into Rust, I found out the array that has that functionality has the same name as the package in Node.js that handles the same thing. And after that, we got the example to give us a new fucking error. This time, a Discord app error that was sold on the Discord app website. And that's when the example finally worked. The rest of the first stream was spent figuring out Rust while recreating one of the examples, the number 17. And while during the stream I did figure out how to do all the general code I needed, like how to use match, format, async functions and how to send messages, it took a lot of free writing using the code from the repo for the example to run successfully. But I guess that's the learning process. This is how the example command we built looks. So. We send the command, which in our case was ping, with the prefix being tilde. The bot deletes your command. I don't really know why. I guess it was just there to show us how to do it. Then it sends the message pong, which includes the selector bar, where you can choose an option in the same channel you send the message. Then, if you don't select anything in the set period of time, which for us is 3 minutes, it sends a message saying timed out. 
But if you do select something, it deletes the message, pong, the select bar, and it sends back the message with the value you selected. At the end of the first stream, we decided how we are going to do the reaction to raw part and which API to use specifically. And the weirdest thing that happened on the first stream was when I got spammed by random YouTube bots. It was so frustrating and I tried so fucking hard to ban them all, but it took a long time to ban even one of them, let alone all of them. But thankfully, they stopped after some time. Now we are gonna start making the real deal. First things first, we want a way to serialize and deserialize data, for which I found a crate called Serde. It had many crates that work with different formats such as JSON, TOML, YAML, etc. At first, I decided I wanted to use something I've never used before, so I randomly chose YAML. And I've got to tell you, that was the worst option I could have chosen. Having never used it, I had no idea how the format works. And let me tell you something once again. The docs did not help, and they were very unintuitive and hard to understand. So after spending some time trying to understand it, I just decided to drop it and use JSON for serializing and deserializing. After testing if it works, I go to detailing the structs that I'm going to use. The structs look something like this. We have our main struct called container, which, well, contains all of our data and acts as the parent. It contains an optional path string that gets set every time that we deserialize the data, and then two more fields called guilds and messages. Guilds is a hash map of string IDs of the Discord servers that are in the Discord official IP terms called guilds, map to the guild struct. The guild struct contains its ID, this time the unsigned 64-bit number version, a vector of emojis, as well as a vector of roles. The reason we keep those is for caching purposes, so we don't have to send a request to the Discord API every time a command is processed. Messages is also a hash map, this time the key being the string ID of the message, while well, the value is a struct called message actions. The struct, similar to the guild struct, contains the ID of the message, again using the unsigned 64-bit number measure. It also contains a vector of the roles of another struct called emoji role mapping. That struct, just as the name suggests, maps the emoji to the role it should be given when reacted with. The two fields it has are a string called emoji and an unsigned 64-bit number called the role. These structs will be updated in the future as more features are added, but will probably be changed to use some database like MySQL or something similar instead of JSON for serializing and deserializing the data. And then came probably the hardest part of the whole project, actually storing and reading data in memory, i.e. without re reading the file every time I needed something. While it would have been easy if I used some kind of a database, I could, as I could just query the needed data, the problem arose since I was using in-memory data. And one of the biggest problems was not being able to modify handle itself as it wasn't mutable. And after trying to go around that somehow for some time, I decided to have a global static mutable object instead of it being inside the handler, which took me down a rabbit hole of its own. While doing this, I learned an important part of Rust, the life cycle of a variable. But I had one more rabbit hole to go down through, that being thread safety. The reason being that the bot is async, meaning that the functions can be pulled on multiple threads. So if the data was not being stored correctly, it could and most likely would be corrupted because of the reads and writes being done out of sync, i.e. One process could be writing to the variable as the other one is reading it, causing it to read the data wrongly. The way I did it in the end was creating a global static variable using a lazy static crate named bot data that held the mutex to the actual data of the bot that was stored with a struct container. Mutex was needed to lock and unlock the variable as it's being used so that multiple threads couldn't interact with it at the same time data would only be read when the bot starts, then updated in memory, on, and on every update it would be written back to the file it was read from, saving the new update. What I also learned is that the Rust compiler will not allow you to use the same locked variable after calling an async function, 
which makes sense as the data could be changed, but it also made my life a living hell, because even though it said that coin drop would cause it to unlock the mutex, that did not stop the errors, so I had to do some questionable decisions, as well as make a lot of scope so that mutex could drop dead on its own. Now came the time to choose how the user would interact with the bot to create the emoji to roll connections for the message. At first I wanted to do it the select type of style as we did in the first stream copying the example, but couldn't do it because I could not find a list of all the supported emojis on Discord. So I decided on a simple format. First the actual command of course, tilde selector space rolls, then the list of emoji to roll bindings in a format open parenthesis emoji then the pipe symbol and then the roll name then close the parentheses and you could change the format however many times you wanted to create as many emoji to roll bindings as you wanted the command is actually a sub command as i wanted to leave space open to create more selector commands because why not because of the auto binding of the names of the commands it took some trial and error to get it to work i did try to put an argument into the command tag but that did not work, so I just left the name of the functions to be selector and roles. In both functions, I put a simple usage message if the command was empty, or in the case of the selector command, if it was ever called alone, as it could only ever be called with a subcommand in mind. After that, I started working on command parsing. It took some time, as there wasn't a subtring function, so I had to do it some other way. Because slicing using the index operated worked on a scale of bytes, not characters. But in the end, I found it easier to just replace the open parenthesis and close parenthesis with empty strings. Then I created a function to find the role by its name, using optional, which was a new experience for me. And I have to say, I love match. It's just great. The ease of use and the looks just 10 out of 10, and I can't wait to use it again. I also had to use some generics to allow all types of strings to be used in the method because there's string, str and an str reference and they are not interchangeable so I had to use generics which were pretty easy. While parsing the command I had a pack of strings storing the mapping message to the user and after parsing the command it would send a message from the vector joined by the new line. After sending the message I had to figure out how to react to it. And the only problem I had there was that in the documentation it says that the name of the custom emojis is optional, so I did not fill it in when reacting. And guess what? It might not be needed by the API, but it sure as hell is needed to actually work, because the reaction would not show up without the name. And it took me some time to figure it out, as I thought I made an error somewhere else in the code, possibly in the setup maybe forgetting to add some options or permissions, but no, it was the name of the custom emojis. At the end of the community function, I would add the message action data to the bot data and save it to the file. And the last part was creating methods for some events in the implementation of the handler. The first one we are going to create are role create and role update functions. The first one is so we can add the role when it's created, and the second one so we can update the role when the name changes. At first, I only implemented the role create function, but as it seems, when creating the role in Discord, after you give it a name, it actually sends the role create event first, but, and it's a big but, it sends it with the original role name, normally being something like new role, which took me time to figure out. 15 plus tries actually, as you can see by all the created roles because I could not understand why I could not get the new role name. And now for the last thing, implementing the react and add and react and remove events. It was simple to do, except the part where I could not figure out how to add a role or how to remove a role from the user. After scavenging the Serenity documentation, I found I should be using a member and not a user. Why would you separate it? Anyways, after creating a function in the implementation of the message I construct for finding the role from the emoji, which included finding out how to use structs in a match, I finished the code. Afterwards, I just did some cleanup, like removing the unneeded comments, 
unneeded functions such as the pick command and its subfunctions, cleaning up some imports, cleaning the mutex up, and also added an error printing for the adding roles because one of the roles I used to test the bot was above it, which caused it to error out some weird ass message errors, which took some time figuring out. So that was my experience writing a Discord bot in Rust with zero experience with both Rust and NeoVim. It took whole 12 hours, but it was worth it. My experience, while sometimes painful, was mostly positive. I loved working in Rust and also loved writing in NeoVim. It took some getting used to, but in the end it was great. I can't wait to actually continue working on the bot at a later point in time with suggestions from you guys. If you want to see the whole process, you can click the link in the description that's going to bring you to the playlist of all 5 streams made while writing this bot. If you made it this far, you ought to like and subscribe. If you want, you can support me on my Patreon down in below. See you next project.